So um, I'm really excited about starting the new year talking about excellence because that's really where we're going to be thinking and moving this entire year, particularly focusing on uh, clinical excellence and how we can raise the bar for all the work we do with respect to patients. And M&Ms like this morning remind us how important that is that for there's no complication that's trivial to the patient who gets it. There is no residual disease, small amount that um, isn't important to the patient who has it. And so it is our moral responsibility all of the time to be uh, doing our very best all the time. And that's a hard thing to do given the fact that we work so hard and that uh, it's it's a 110% kind of job, but for the patient who's getting the care, every little millimeter matters. So with that, I'm anxious to introduce Dr. Farkas to uh, our Chief of Colorectal to start us off in the first of the new year. Thanks. All right, can people hear me? I'm not sure how well this microphone is working in the back, okay. So um, to start off to say Happy New Year to everybody. It's been a year since I had my California license, and so it's kind of fitting that I guess I start off the new year given the talk. So I've spent a year sitting in those seats listening to everybody else's talk, and I can say because of Nassim, I do have a yoga mat in my office, mindfulness. Um, for all the David Grant faculty and residents, all your talk about all your ballistics. I did go shooting. Um, Joe, I will never think of Good Friday as I did before after your talk and on everything. And Dr. Pugh, um, you know, as colorectal surgeons, we kind of envy the plastic surgeon. Everybody gets to see their great work, but nobody quite gets to see our great work. So, of course, as a colorectal surgeon, I'm going to be talking about the rectum, which I understand for everybody else, this is your vision of the rectum. But for us as a colorectal surgeon, this is our vision of the rectum. This is what makes us as a colorectal surgeon. And so I hope by the end of this, I get you to realize what is the rising importance of rectal cancer right now in regards for the patients importance and also for us as surgeons what our importance is in the care and talking about the history of rectal cancer care which will get you to understand how we're getting to our new standardization of rectal cancer care and what are some of the current national efforts that we're doing so colorectal cancer colon cancer is getting lower we're are doing screening screening is mattering but when you come to the incidence of it for young individuals for colon cancer and especially for rectal cancer the projections are going to be astronomical we're not quite sure why is it the biome is our colonic microbiome is it perhaps um, our foods which change our microbiome our lack of activity but there is definitely something going on genetically um, with the type of cancers that are occurring in the young. So do we want to radiate the 25-year-old with rectal cancer? We have to start really thinking about how we're going to treat people who have another 60 years of life. Surgeons have always been a captain for rectal cancer because it takes a coordination of effort for most of these patients in regards to their chemotherapy and the radiation and the timing and their surgery. And with rectal cancer, I mean, 84% of the time when these patients present to our office, we're looking at them that we have to cure them. They're not necessarily presenting with significant metastatic disease. So historically, rectal cancer was not treated surgically because there was the risk of bleeding. And what do you do about the sphincter? But then the French started operating, but at that time it was just diversion is what they were doing. They were placing um, colostomies. One of the, um, but their results even with that wasn't very good with only six out of 27 surviving in one of the earliest um, reviews. One that did survive was actually in the Pentecostomy, but she only survived 18 days. She actually died of mercury poisoning because in those days, that's how they treated bowel obstructions. They would throw mercury down the um, intestines. 
So we have come a long, long way. From the days of operating in you know, grand theaters, um, from the times when nobody was using gloves or wearing masks, and to now to laparoscopic surgery and to um, robotic surgery. But how did we get here and where do we have to go from here? So again, the actual early surgery on the rectum, again, wasn't removal. It was just ablating the cancer and then giving the patient a colostomy. The actual first perineal proctectomy was probably an accident. It was a perforated rectal cancer, which had created so much of a um, ischial rectal abscess during the debridement of it. Um, back in 1739, a resection was actually performed. And even in the 1874 with Kraske and, um, and with um, Coker, when they were doing their perineal approaches, they were actually giving patients an anal colostomy. Um, they were not given an abdominal colostomy at that time. But then we got better with the help of spinal anesthetic, general anesthetic, um, antisepsis was born. And then the first abdominal approach to rectal cancer was until 1879. While we all talk about the Hartman procedure, the actual Hartman was actually performed by Gassenhauer, um, who was the first one to do a resection and then give the patient abdominal colostomy um, and leaving the perineal portion of the distal rectum behind. Just as we always attribute the APR to Dr. Miles, actually the first APR was done by, um, by Cherney. And, but it was Miles who, because he was studying under Cripps, that we started to understand the fact that we had to take out the blood supply. We had to take out the lymphatics. So it was more than just taking out the rectum that was involved in the care of the patient. But, you know, when your recurrence rate and your survival rate is about equal, it's probably not the best operation, but it was the best at that time. And when you look at, when you look at the initial um, drawings, you can see this is not a good TME. And this is probably why the survival wasn't as great with these patients, because they were leaving behind a lot of the lymph nodes. And so a lot of the procedures were actually done as a two-step procedure. So the APR was not done in one. It was first a colostomy, then coming back, and then removing the rectum. And it wasn't until World War II that it became more accepted to do it as a one, one procedure. And it wasn't until after um, Duke was noticing that there was actually less of a lymph node retrieval with the two-step. And so um, now we start having some of the American um, surgeons having a great input into what became part of what is now today rectal cancer surgery. Dr. Balfour was one of the first to actually do one of the first anastomosis. Now this was a long mucosectomy and a pull through in which he left a drain in place. Um, it had a huge complication rate in regards to infection. And then 1946, Mayo Clinic, Dr. Dixon was the first to actually do a hand-sewn anastomosis. And he had a great, pretty darn low mortality of 2.6% back in the 1940s. And his five-year survival was about 65%, which quite honestly was about the same for many, many years since the 1940s. As you can note, they limit the hand-sewn anastomosis at five centimeters, not only because it was technically difficult, but also because it was thought at that time that because of the distal spread of the disease, anything about six centimeters and up deserved an APR at that period of time. But then with more um, discovery, we learned that two centimeter was enough. Bile prep was invented. And then Dr. Ravitch took a trip to Russia. And actually, if you read the actual historical account of Dr. Ravitch, when he went to Russia, it was actually just to look at their blood transfusion um, of what they were doing over there in Russia. And no, nobody would talk to him. They wouldn't let him go in to see the wards. But there was one Russian surgeon who kind of showed him the staplers that they were using at that time. 
And so, you know, Ravage obviously wanted to bring it back to America, but, you know, 1950s Russia, they weren't really dancing with us very well, put it that way. But then as he was walking around, he noticed a storefront that was actually selling some staplers. So for 400 rubles, he and his um, traveling companion each bought one, hid it in their luggage. Um, so hoping if only just one was found, they would still have the other and brought this back. And this is the beginning of US Surgical, which um, became Tyco, which then now is um, Medtronic. So from the 1960s to the 80s, it was pretty quiet. I think everybody was just trying to figure out how to use the staples. And also screening was starting for colorectal cancer. And then in the 1980s, Dr. Quirk, an English um, pathologist, started noticing that there's more than just that distal margin. He started to notice there's something about the circumferential margin. And so looking at a review of 52 patients, when he saw that when there was a positive margin, the recurrence rate was astronomical. So there was more than just a distal margin to be concerned about which then led to Dr. Heald, another British surgeon. Now, granted, there was a lot of colorectal surgeons in the 80s doing a good TME, but Dr. Heald was the one that really took it on the road and start training a lot of individuals, which we'll go into. And basically, there were a lot of people that were just going right through the mesentery as opposed to removing all the mesenteric nodes. Now, Dr. Hild had a very impressive 2% um, local recurrence rate that probably no one else could quite um, also uh, reproduce. But anything less than 7% in the 90s was the standard that we were hoping for. And then there was the thought of, well, what's more important? Is it the circumferential margin or it's the TME? And so um, it wasn't until 2002 that we noted that even if you do a great TME and you have a circumferential margin, there is still a high local recurrence. But even more important that there's also a higher risk of death later with met metastatic disease. Yes, total measle rectal excision. But they took their boards, right? They know that. But I apologize. Um, so the CRM is the circumferential margin, then TME is the total measle rectal excision. And so while Dr. Heald was proponing that this was basically a sense of a marker for how good the surgeon is, I think with Dr. Weebs, we started to note that the circumferential margin, while it is still a marker of how good the surgeon is, is also a marker of how good our pathologists are, and also it's probably the activity of the disease. And this in 2002 started to become what we started to see was the multi-D approach that was necessary for rectal cancer. So going back a little bit in regards to um, rectal cancer, you know, surgery was um, obviously not good enough because Dr. Dixon was only getting about a 60% five-year survival. So during the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of play around with in re regards to what do we do with our chemo and radiation. And so Fisher in Pittsburgh with the NSAB R01 showed that chemotherapy with um, radiation after surgery did increase survival. And as they looked at it, again, with other studies, looking at one or the other to see what really mattered, while chemotherapy increased survival, radiation after surgery did not, but it did decrease local recurrence. In the 1990s, it then became a standard that every patient would get post-op chemo radiation and that was for the stage two and stage three. So stage two rectal cancers are those that have a T3 full thickness through the rectal wall with no lymph node involvement. T3 are those that no matter what the T stage is, lymph nodes are involved with the disease. So we try to do a study here in America looking at should we give pre-op versus post-op chemo radiation. It was somewhat of a disaster because nobody would accrue to the study. 
a lot of surgeons were very um, stubborn in regards to, well, I know post-op is best, I know pre-op is best. And so accrual was terrible. They wanted to get 900 and they had to stop the study after 116. But what we did learn from it was that with pre-op neoadjuvant therapy, there was an 8% complete response back at that time. And when we thought 50% of the time we could spare the sphincter, if we gave neoadjuvant therapy, 33% of the time we were able to spare the sphincter. But that was all that we can conclude from this. And it wasn't until 2004 when the Germans did a great study comparing directly pre-op versus post-op um, um, chemo radiation. So in the pre-op arm, basically chemo radiation, very similar to what we give into America, and the red dot is shown when they had their surgery, followed by um, a period of recovery, and then adjuvant therapy, very similar to what we do right now. Their definition of the rectum was 16 centimeters from the anal verge, so they were pr pretty aggressive in regards to their chemo radiation. Um, Note that what their staging was. It was with ultrasound and CAT scan, and we're going to revisit this. Conceivably, all was done as a TME. The, Rush, the Germans were um, trained at that time in regards to doing TMEs. Non-significant was the age, the sex, and the stage. Was significant was that there tended to be a little bit more in the pre-op arm that was much lower and closer to the anal verge. Overall, the results was that there was a greater sphincter preservation, as we would expect with the neoadjuvant therapy, and much less um, radiation toxicity if you gave the radiation up front as opposed to um, postoperatively. But note that there isn't a difference in survival. And so what, what is that about? Um, you would think that there might be a better survival in these individuals. And we're going to come back and reevaluate that also. The other thing was in the post op arm, because they never got their neoadjuvant therapy, we could see that with our current modalities of ultrasound and CAT scan, we were overstaging 18%. So 18% of patients conceivably in that pre op arm received neoadjuvant therapy when they did not need it. So think back again to now what we're going to have is perhaps an epidemic of young patients with rectal cancer. Do we really want to give potentially 20% of the individuals radiation? Probably not. Not unless they need it. So now as we journey through rectal cancer, we start to look at what about our techniques? So this all started first with laparoscopic surgery, a plethora of studies which looked at laparoscopic colon versus open colons, because we had a concern that maybe we weren't doing well for the patients oncologically. And you can see with all these studies, the Barcelona trial, which I first thought laparoscopic surgery was going to be best, but we found out with the cost and the color and the classic that at least laparoscopic surgery was safe. But none of these studies include rectal cancer other than the classic trial. And with the classic trial, there was a concern. There was high positive margins in regards to the patients that were having laparoscopic rectal cancer surgery. And so therefore, there was actually a mandate from SAGES and ASCARS that laparoscopic rectal cancer surgery from that study should not be performed unless patients were actually being placed on um, trials at that period of time. So under James Fleshman, um, a CASOG z study was um, put together. It was a randomized trial of laparoscopic versus open. And I, I was on this study at Pittsburgh and actually transferred the study over to Duke. And um, there were some limitations on this study. We were looking at only the lower rectal cancers, 12 centimeters and lower. Um, BMI less than 35, so we were not performing this on the obese patients. And um, this was a non-inferiority trial. So we were just hoping to prove that laparoscopic rectal cancer was just as good as open. And so what were we going to measure as measurements of success? 
Well, we were going to look at the distal margin, the circumferential margin, and did we do a complete TME. And so every surgeon who was on this study had to send in an unedited video proven that they can do a TME. So everybody was known to be able to perform a good TME laparoscopically. And so even with the best of best surgeons, as Dr. Fleshman would say, you know, we weren't really achieving non-inferiority. So taking all three of these parameters together, we were able to accomplish it about 87% of the time open, but only 82% of the time laparoscopically. So therefore, the conclusion was, and if you notice, this was just published in 2015 in JAMA, that we can't really support laparoscopic surgery for rectal cancer patients when it's 12 centimeters and lower. And it appeared to be especially even worse the lower that we went um, down into the pelvis. So the answer was thought maybe robotics would be the answer. I also participated in this study, and quite honestly, the reason I participated in this is because the selection was a lot lower. But this was a study that was just really looking at the difference in conversion. If you look at a lot of the classic trials and the other um, laparoscopic proctectomy trials, which were single sites, the conversion rate was astronomical. It was 20, 25% for laparoscopic rectal cancer. Um, so here's a video showing robotic surgery. The rectum is here, and this is going down towards the an anus. So the foot of the patient's down there. The right is here, the left is here. And this is starting to dissect around the IMA. So the ROLAR trial was actually an international study. And a few sites in the um, United States was participating, but it, it belonged in Leeds. And so Leeds was where the classic trial was. And also in England, you have Dr. Quirk, who's looking at circumferential margins. Um, and so this was a top-notch study that was being performed. But you know, we, we do kind of regret that maybe we had done it more like the ACASOG trial, but we were just looking at the conversion rates. So we anticipated um, 400 patients in each arm, and in actuality, the accrual was so good that we exceeded our numbers in accruing in the laparoscopic arm versus the, um, the robotic arm. And um, one of the reasons that I, I joined this study was that because there was no limitation. So when I was in Pittsburgh, and every time I had someone with the BMI 37, I couldn't put them on the trowel, so then I had to do them open. And so trying to do open in a obese person became quite difficult. But then we were able to start put patients on the robotic trowel because there was no limitations in regards to um, what their BMI was. There also was no limitations in regards to the height of the tumor. So overall, with the results of the study, um, you know, the patients were randomized very nicely. But overall, while there was an equivalent of men and women in both arms, overall there was a huge amount of men in the study, um, a pretty decent amount of obese and overweight, because I expect most of us on the study were accruing to the ACASOG trial, putting our thinner patients in that trial. And a good amount of them did receive neoadjuvant therapy. 20% of the patients actually received an APR in this study. So what were the results? And these have not been published yet. Um, they're still looking through a lot of the numbers. But basically, we can show that um, the length of stay was about equivalent for robotic versus laparoscopic. We were able to complete a TME 75% of the time. And I'm going to show you pictures of a complete and a near complete. But complete and near complete are thought to be fairly equivalently good in pathology literature, and we were able to, to do that 90% of the time. So this study, actually, I, I feel like we had a better good pathological result overall than with the ACASOG trial. But overall, it was non-significant. 
but there is some suggestion that looking at the conversion rate when it's much lower in the pelvis, our conversion rate was much lower with the obese male deep in the pelvis. Now they're still looking at local recurrence and that data is still churning out to see what that's going to show. Um, but overall the circumferential margin rate was quite low in both arms. And our conversion rate was actually very small, it was 12%. So I think what is going to um, be the new um, kid on the block for us to perform is the top TME. So this is a transanal total mesorectal excision. And so with a single port within the anus, and this is showing with the rectum is now basically um, circumferentially tied. Now we're going to do a TME from the bottom. This is very new. So if you do a, um, a search on the um, PubMed, put in top TME and rectal cancer, you're only going to find 56 articles. I did it last night, only 56 articles. And um, so we did the first one, um, Dr. Guevara and I, in July. We were very fortunate when we trained, we actually had Dr. Lacey um, and Dr. Atala as our preceptors. And this is Dr. Atala here who did um, come out here to UC Davis to preceptor us through our first procedure. So this is something we will proceed with caution. This is a patient who did not have rectal cancer. He was getting a total proctocolectomy for ulcerative colitis. And so, um, you know, you do not want to mess up the, the TME, obviously, because we don't want to do anything that's not safe for the patient. But if you look at the meta-analysis, and so you can see as we're going circumferentially around with this TME um, stage, and then um, there'll be one point, yeah, right about here. See, that's the prostate right there. You'll never get to see the prostate as well as you can there with the TME dissection. So there's, there's a lot in regards to having those positive margins that were found on the ACASOG trial. This may help to negate some of this. So when you look at the meta-analysis that was performed, again, kind of smaller numbers, but actually with the top TME as, as opposed to what they're calling now the LA TME, the laparoscopic TME, you can do a better TME. Your circumferential margin is not only is it negative, it's longer negative. Um, and the OR time is actually decreased. And the reason that the OR time is decreased is because you can have someone concomitantly above operating while you're operating from below. Now, most centers that are doing this do have two or three surgeons actually in the operating room helping with this. So there is a registry um, that's international, and they just, um, this also has not been published yet, but about to be published of their first series of 100, 720 individual patients, and basically was able to get a 96% complete to near complete TME. And so um, what they deem was a poor pathological um, evaluation, whether it's a positive distant margin or circumferential margin, or major defects in the TME was, they said 44, but I only counted 40 in their paper, but that's a pretty, that's pretty good. Um, that's better than what we can be doing with open or laparoscopic surgery. But now we have the MRI, and the MRI is changing the game. And this was all done by the Mercury Group, and again, it's the multi-D. The Mercury Group is made up of pathologists, radiologists, and surgeons over in England. And through their, their multitude of studies that have come out from 2003, they have shown that if the mesorectal fascia is, is um, noted to be positive on the MRI, and the mesorectal fascia is that small fascia that we see in the operating room that we go in that avascular plane, you can see that on the MRI. You can't see that on an ultrasound. And if that's positive, that has a direct um, impact on five-year overall survival. Extra rectal nodes, so those nodes that we can see in the iliacs, can't see that on an ultrasound. We can see that on an MRI. That is a marker of poor disease-free survival. 
And on ultrasound, lymph nodes were just looked at what the size was. MRI is now showing size does not matter with lymph nodes. These teeny tiny lymph nodes of four millimeter, five millimeter that we didn't consider were positive in ultrasound are positive. And so now you have to look at the heterogeneity of the node. And also now the um, vascular invasion can be looked at on MRI. Again, cannot be looked at on ultrasound. And what's becoming more exciting is T3s are not just T3s. They're A, B, and C. And so there may be a difference in regards to who do we need to radiate. Small numbers, but very suggestive from the Mercury group. And when they looked at their patients, um, this is part of the, the initial study when they were just trying to figure out what is the positive circumferential margin and can they be able to predict it preoperatively for the patients in their multi-D trials. And they can show that they, there is a 92% um, percent specificity to show that their circumferential margins were negative. And so by using this, they were able to, to then go back and look at their patients who were stage two and stage three. And looking at those that were stage two, the earlier T3 A's and B's, and T3 A and B means it's with the, it goes through the wall of the rectum only by five millimeters. Regardless, with the negative lymph node status, a very low recurrence rate. Even those individuals with a positive lymph node, no, ma no matter what the T stage was, as long as that lymph node did not touch that mesorectal fascia, again, none of these patients got radiation. And look at the recurrence rate. It's very low. So how are we doing? Well, if we go back to the 90s, again, how were we doing? So, you know, Dr. Heald, of course, no one could be as good as Dr. Heald, getting that 2.4%. But Anchor in New York was getting pretty low. And again, 7% less is what we expected. Look what was going on in Norway and Netherlands. We know what was going on in Norway and Netherlands because they have national health system. All their patients are registered. And so therefore, they knew what their local recurrence rate was, and it was terrible. So what did they do? They did a rectal cancer project, and they started workshops. And Dr. Heald came over and started training all the surgeons because they had a 15 to 20 percent local recurrence rate. And this is what they were able to accomplish in just three years. They were able to increase the amount of TME dissections that were done from 78 to 92 percent. They were able to increase their four-year survival and to decrease their local recurrence in half. And this is phenomenal because in Norway, they don't use radiation. So this is the great results that they could get without using neoadjuvant therapy. So they weren't the only ones to do this. Spain and Ireland also looked at theirs. Spain had nothing to look at. They had no type of um, registry to look at. So they said, well, we're just going to teach everybody TME that does at least 10 rectal cancers a year. And then we're going to see what our survival and local recurrence rate was after their study. And they got down to a very low local recurrence rate, just like the Norwegians were able to. And the Irish also reproduced the same um, numbers by training. Canada, Canada has a fairly good way to look at all their numbers. And they looked at it by providences. And so they were looking at their circumferential margins, which as we know is a reflection of local recurrence and survival. So where do you want to have your surgery? Do you want to go to Nova Scotia? Or do you want to go to Manitoba? And I can tell you that the place that has the lowest circumferential um, margin is not the highest volume center. So we always talk about high volume is the place to go. It doesn't mean high volume is also the highest quality, at least not in Canada. So how are we doing in the United States? So we do have some national databases to look at. And so one of the things that we can look at is how good are we by looking at how well can we spare the sphincter. Rule our trial, 20% APR. But that was probably somewhat selective, because probably the lower rectal cancers were being accrued on that study. 
But if we do look at all of the rectal cancer patients by looking at the nationwide inpatient sample, which they kind of randomly take 20% of the proctectomies in the country. So we're talking 41,000 patients. What do you think our colostomy, permanent colostomy rate was? Over 50? Under 50? 60%. We're not doing too well. Local recurrence. So, you know, with our NCCN database, we can't really look at local recurrence, but we can look at the, um, the circumferential margin. Where are we? 17%. Okay? We're not doing well. Which is why um, a group of colorectal surgeons, and I love the name, ostrich, right? Um, optimizing surgical treatment for rectal cancer was um, put together with five core principles. And basically everything that I presented. So the core principles are based on, basically on what we have found through the literature and our studies. That there has to be a good TME. That we have to be able to measure our quality. And then we need to have specialists like the radiologist and MRI helping us preoperatively, and a multi-D team. This is a necessity. And so this is fairly new. I mean, it's been only been April 2015 when we all sat down in a room and started thinking about what of our standards are going to be, and let us make the standards, and then let us partner with the COC and the ACS in regards to what we as our society want to make as our standards. And using structure and using the patient care processes and a time to treat um, to, to then collect our data and do performance measures. I mean, the whole reason that Norway and Germany and all those other societies were able to do so well in their literature and expand rectal cancer care is because of the fact that they, they do kind of have this socialistic medicine. They all do the TME. They all are doing things the same way, which allows them to measure and stage and then do and accrue studies much better than we were able to here. So part of this is the MDT, and there has to be a nurse coordinator, and there has to be certain amount of um, people buying into this. So there needs to be a medical oncologist, a pathologist, a radiologist, a radiation oncologist, and of course a surgeon, right? And um, with this multi-D, there has to be 90% attendance, and one person from each of these um, teams has to show up at least 50% of the time. So this is so, such that you know pathology can't just send um, four pathologists 25% of the time. We want a core person because, as you see, it's a continual educational process where we're all teaching each other. And so pathology is going to be doing standardized assessments of our TME. So, you know, the studies where the Germans said, well, we did a good TME, well, you said that, but did you really do that? So now the TME is actually going to be graded along with the circumferential margin. They just got their digital um, camera here, so there's going to be digital photographs of all the TMEs and the synoptic reports. And, you know, this, there's, everybody's buying into this. The College of American Pathologists are buying into this also. So here's some pictures of a TME. This is a good, this is an okay-ish, and this is a bad. So with a good, complete TME, the defects are limited to less than five millimeters. The muscularis propria is not exposed. And then when the radiologists cut it to look for their circumferential margin, they should see fat surrounding the whole area. A near complete, you can see there's a little gash here, but it's um, not down to the muscularis propria. And you can see when they cut to their circumferential margins, it's going to show up. And then this is one where the muscularis propria is exposed. And so they'll also look at how is that CMR positive? Is it positive because of direct tumor? Is it because there's the lymph nodes affecting that? Or is it because that there is um, lymphovascular invasion? Radiology, the MRI reports are going to be standardized. 
and they look at the distance from the anal verge. The T3s are going to be divided into T3As, T3Bs, and T3Cs. They're looking to look at the shortest distance to the mesorectal fascia. We want at least two millimeters. Um, to be able to be assured, we're going to get a negative margin. They're going to look at um, vascular invasion and also looking at um, lymph nodes. Again, endorsed by the American College of Radiologists. For the surgeons, well, we may have to take a written test. We're putting a test together in regards to do you truly understand what a TME is? And will we be teaching by videos or will we have courses? We don't know quite yet. And there's even talk that we may have synoptic reports on how we dictate our operations to make sure all the core features are in there. So how does this actually work? Well, if you kind of divide up the patient into being pretreatment and treatment and post-treatment, and then what we call um, adjuvant, post-adjuvant therapy, you know, it looks very simplistic in where the patient enters the system and then they end up getting their treatment. And right now, we're, they had six sites that were kind of playing with this. And actually, initially, this was 30 days, and then they realized that was not going to work. Because you'll see as, as we go through the next slide. But now it's 90% of the patients within 60 days need to hit their treatment parameters, which may be surgery. And then within two weeks, the pathologists have to have their pathology report. And within six weeks, um, and this number is different on different slides because they're still playing around with this, how many of our patients actually um, enter into adjuvant therapy? But this is what really happens, right? A patient enters into the system, and when they enter the system, we have 60 days. But what happens is we present them, and then we say, you know, we probably need another study to determine if this patient needs neoadjuvant therapy or not. So they get more work up and they come back. And then they end up getting their neoadjuvant therapy. And so we're supposed to present them again after their neoadjuvant therapy. And then they go to the operating room, they get their surgery, and we get the path back and we present them again. And then we want them to get into their adjuvant therapy within six weeks, and after adjuvant therapy, we present them again. So you can see that this is a minimum of three, but maybe each patient will be presented five times. And what are we doing? We're looking at the pathology report, because if I was told my patient was a T2N1 and I resect it and it's a T3N2, we're pulling up that MRI with our radiologist to say, what did we miss here? Can we now see maybe how we under, underestimated what the staging of the individual was? And so that's why there has to be that one person, that radiologist has to be there at least half of the time so we can make sure that we're all learning from each other so we are doing the best of care for the patients. And during the pre-op evaluation, we have to have the pathology report, they have to be staged. This initially just changed because we were saying probably an MRI or an ultrasound will work. But no, we know now the MRI is so much a higher, um, superior um, way to, re to evaluate the patients preoperatively. So an ultrasound may be icing on the cake, but ultrasound is out. Because remember in the German study, probably the whole reason why we didn't get a better survival was because they were just doing stage two to stage three. I expect that our guidelines in regards to the AGCC are going to be separating into those T3 A, Bs, and Cs eventually. And they were only looking at ultrasound and CAT scans as they're staging. So we're getting, we're getting better at subdividing our rectal cancer patients. So what are we doing now? We're doing deliberate practice. Um, and from this, we will continue to learn from repetition of looking at these patients. And so who do we have right now at UC Davis as a part of our multi-D? We have um, Karen Matsukama from Pathology. We have Dr. Sakan from um, Radiology, Dr. Manjazab from Radiation Oncology, and our medical oncologists. These are our core people that are, are showing up two times a month at a minimum so we can review every single rectal cancer patient because that is, is going to be mandated. 
And then when they can't make it, there's other people that kind of kick in and help out when they're on their vacations. And I would be amiss if I don't also thank my thoracic surgeons and my surgical oncologists because rectal cancer does go to the liver. It does go to the, to the lungs. And so therefore, um, you know, we, we ask them come in for um, when we need them for their expertise for the metastatic patients, but we're able to keep most of the, um, the, the, the multi-D to the, to the kind of the five core specialties. And so we just had a nurse um, coordinator come on. So um, probably this April, we'll be looking at our one year of data to see how well we're doing with our practicing and see where we need to make our improvements. So currently at this time, there are no centers of excellence. There is, nobody is accredited at this time. There are six sites that practiced officially and the COC is looking at it to see how they're doing and to see, um, um, to work out some of the kinks before this gets um, launched nationally. So here we are, we're gonna strive for excellence one millimeter at a time. We know it's not gonna be a straight pathway. Um, but um, we will get there. And um, I especially have to thank Bill over there who helped me with my videos as I was freaking out trying to get my videos in. He did a great job. And I thank you all for um, helping us to try to get a lot of this launched. It's been a big endeavor. Thank you. I just really want to thank you for this great presentation and what a fantastic way to sort of start the new year. I think it's important as we think about all of these diseases, and you're right, people don't want to think about rectal cancer or <laughs> colon cancer very often, but again, to the patient who has it, it's the most important thing. And whether you're going to spend your life with a colostomy when you're 20, or whether you have a chance for cure plus sphincter preservation is incredibly important. And so developing, I know how hard it is, and I'm sorry, Shin left and other people who have started to try to create multidisciplinary programs in hospitals that haven't had them before, coming after what you know, trauma has done for a long time. It is the right way to care for patients, to get the same radiologists, the same pathologists, the same surgeons looking together at the all the specimens of learning. It's what's happened with prostate cancer, with breast cancer, with many esophageal cancer, many of the other any of the other programs. So this is hard work. It's pulling teeth to get these people to be part of these multidisciplinary programs. And I really just want to commend you and thank you. Yeah, My first cool. question is, I want how many people know what a synop synoptic operative report is? All right, why don't you explain synoptic reports to the majority of the people who don't know um, what we're talking about? So basically, it's, it's a checklist. So pathologists have had it probably close to 10 years. The MRI has been about five years. Um, we don't have one for surgery, though when I was entering to be a site PI for the ACASOG trial, while we didn't have synoptic reports, we knew what needed to be in that report to justify that we knew how to do a TME. So basically, um, for the pathologists, you know, they have to have the grading, they have to have the CMR, they have to have everything checked off and filled in to make sure that everything was looked at. Okay, I think, yeah, I think for surgery it's a little different because once you, you step out of the operating room, you're done. Um, but probably a lot of that synoptic report is probably going to be the pre-op workup that you will fill in your pre-op workup to know that everything was done prior, but hopefully that's also done in the multi-D. But you know, for rectal cancer, I'm sure it's gonna have dictating you're going through the TME plane, that you've um, seen the splanchnic nerves, that you have seen the ureters, that you've done a high ligation. If you're doing a coloanal, you're dictating that you're taking the IMV, you've done the splenic flexor takedown, because you can't do a good TME or get a good um, um, dissection on a coloanal by keeping your IMV and a splenic flexor intact. That's nearly impossible. So these will be the things that will be required in the reports. So synoptic reports, the reason I wanted to highlight it, there's talk that this is coming to all of surgery, that we need to have specific documentation about 
how you do an operation and what steps you employ in the operation. And the data are suggesting that it's not just for documentation afterwards, but that there is evidence that by being forced to know that you have to do a synoptic operative report, so you have to say, how many nodes did you see? Did you see this blood vessel? Did you see this nerve? That it actually improves the operative outcome for the patient. Because you're kind of thinking while you're doing the operation, oh yeah, I've got to remember that I've got to see this nerve and make a comment about it. So it helps you remember you've got to see this nerve before you cut. So synoptic reporting is coming probably to all aspects of operations. It's been led in the oncologic world. The other reason that people are talking about this is that it may prevent, because other people are talking about, particularly malpractice attorneys, that why do we not just videotape every operation? You know, why do we rely on what they say they did afterwards? Because to be quite honest, there are surgeons who, and we have encountered this in our experience here, who say they do something, who have done something else, or who may not actually say to the patient what they did in the operation. So there's talk about going to videotape an operation. So I think that many in the surgical field are talking about getting ahead of that, at least through synoptic operative reporting. I think in the transplant world, you know, it's really a variation on standardized operative reports. And I think that those people have used those for a long time. So I think while rectal cancer, you know, highlights this, I think that these are principles that can apply to all of us. So, again, thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions, but I know people have some burning questions for us. Dr. Heindel? Well, the pathologist may have been first with the synoptic reports, but they were dragged kicking and screaming into this. I remember that group almost eviscerating poor Carolyn Compton and some of her colleagues. And she sort of advocated for synoptic reporting so that we could at least capture necessary registry information. Now, getting back to pathology, how does one truly assess a negative circumferential margin? One of the remarkable things about that Cork and Dixon article was your surgeon and pathologist working together. And they didn't just take the edge and take a slice. They stepped section the whole thing and identified positive margin from a little neighboring lymph node on the edge and things like that. My impression is that most pathologists around the country aren't quite that meticulous about that step section. And, of course, in the conduct of your study, that's something that you addressed. And how good are you doing there and what sort of feedback do you get? So we had Mariana Burho, who is a pathologist at the Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and she did a webinar for our pathologists here. And this, again, this will be part of the training of every pathologist who will be taking care of rectal cancer that they're going to have to somehow get training. And so part of it is, you know, putting alcohol, letting it soak in alcohol overnight to find all those lymph nodes, doing the bread loafing, because that's how you can see the circumferential margin. And you saw those pictures of the rectum, which when it looked like a circle, that's the bread loafing. And then you can measure the distance and you ink, obviously, the margins. But it's also grossly, right? So Darina Agui is really big in the, she's in charge of the gross room. And so now with the camera, all the pictures will be gross. And it's when, that's when it's best to note if it is a complete TME, a near complete, or an incomplete TME. So we're starting some of that here. You see?
Dr. Cook? Uh, yeah, that's a great uh, presentation. Uh, I want to go back to your, your tumor board or, or the rectal board. So there's a requirement that all rectal cancer patients be considered in the multivariate. So and then the slide you show that shows sort of the real world problem with that, especially mm -hmm. in, in our institution, which is probably similar to the in the sense that the catchment area is so large, you get patients who are floating around and eat there before they come to you, et cetera. And, Films are old, and, and our, our tumor boards are, are once a week when we get everyone together. Uh, have there been thoughts about utilizing the EMR better in terms of uh, having electronic communication with the multivariate member of the tumor board? Um, and if so, does that count to satisfy that requirement of everyone that is in the multivariate? So it will be a few more months maybe six months before we know what the final recommendations are coming from the COC. But at the last meeting, while that is good and that would be icing on the cake, they want that face-to-face -face or video conference live time. So right now the requirements are twice a month. Um, but, you know, and that's where we are at right now. And it might have to go to weekly as we start accruing these patients because it would be fine if they got presented once and that was it, but we're presenting one patient like three, four, or five times. So after you get five, colorect five rectal cancer patients, that's 15 to 25 presentations you need to do. So it would be nice. I mean, obviously we do a lot of that on the side, emailing back and forth to each other. So we are able to present everything. If we can't get that MRI done, we're calling up on the phone. That's what our nurse coordinator is going to be doing to make sure those patients are starting neoadjuvant or starting surgery by that 60-day mark because we're supposed to have 90%. Now, granted, the 95-year-old who's never going to do anything uh, won't count, but um, our, that's what our goal is. On the other hand, that 95-year-old might live to 104. That's so. true. Thank <laughs> you.